The German Minister of Communication, Hede Marie Witzorek, said, and I quote, I am absolutely convinced that the political and economic empowerment of women is not only smart economics, but also an essential contribution to the realization of human rights and to enhancing effectiveness of age. Imagine where Africa could be if African women were truly enabled to enlist their full potential. On this new edition of the program, we will be talking about women and development through the experience of one woman who is a page setter. She's going to share her views on democracy with us as well and her political life. My guest is a pioneer member of the World Business Forum. She's the chief executive officer of a woman-owned and a woman-run firm called Strategy. And she's also a member of the National Executive Committee of SDF, the city councillor of Douala One. The list is long, but I will stop here. Ms. Kawala, welcome to Street Talk. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a terrific program, I think, so let's get started. Behind every successful man is a successful woman. But behind every successful woman is a man who is trying to stop her. Am I correct? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think, that, I think that saying is outmoded. I mean, first of all, I think women are no longer trying to stand behind men. Uh, and neither do I hope that men are trying to stand behind women. I think really the model that we are looking for is how we can stand beside one another, hand in hand, so that we can move forward and, and uh, take our world forward, definitely take Africa forward. So I think it is uh, need to get out of uh, one person standing behind the other one and more the two of us standing side by side because I think we have exceptional things to contribute as men and as women. Uh, and I think on our African continent, especially, that the women are extraordinary. And so it's really about standing hand in hand beside one another. You are a strong advocate of uh, women entrepreneurship and development. And you've been running a 14-year-old company, which has built into a firm competing in the, in the continent, the African continent and in Europe as well. How did you get to this appreciable level? Uh, I think I got there very simply um, by hard work and by tapping into uh, Cameroonian talent, both male and female talent, but uh, very especially male, uh, female, because about 70% of the people who work in my company are women. And um, we have been able to leverage on our very strong abilities as Cameroonians. Uh, we are very well educated at the level of the continent. We have exceptional analytical and um, strategic uh, capacity. And then we have that language thing, which is that we are bilingual, uh, which makes us very, very competitive at an international, international level. And because of this, we've been able to grow uh, as a firm. You're talking about your company strategy. What is the objective, its main objective? It is a management and marketing consulting firm we focus very much on everything that is the leadership and the strategy of a company. So what we do is we accompany other organizations, either private sector organizations or development organizations, to help them, A, to build and train their leadership, and uh, B, to define their strategies and see how they implement these, these strategies, how they monitor them, how they evaluate, and how they continue to move forward. So basically, we are a company that helps other organizations to do their job better. What actually attracted you to this line of concern? I think I was attracted to consulting because one, it is one of the most exciting fields. I mean, today you're talking about finance, tomorrow you're talking about governance, the next day you're talking about telecom, the day after you are in a village somewhere talking to a woman about how to sell her plantains. So one is that you cover the very broad scope of economic and societal issues. 
And then two is that you deal with people at very, very different levels. As, as I've said, um, I've carried out trainings in uh, some very remote areas uh, in Cameroon. And at the same time, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at the World Bank General Assembly uh, facilitating something with the president of the World Bank and with uh, CEOs from, from around the world. So it allows you to really see the world from many, many different perspectives. Where did you get the sponsorship from to come up with Strategy? Interesting. Uh, I did not get any sponsorship. Uh, Strategies is a um, share capital firm where I put in the majority of the shares and then I had basically friends and family who decided to take that risk at that point in time uh, to put up the rest of the money that we needed to, to start. Now we have to say that being a consulting firm, it's not a capital intensive uh, venture. So we were able to, you know, we had, a, a, I think at the time, about 5 million francs, and we were able to, to kick things off. So we can say it's good business, or we just pay the bills. <laughs> I would say that it is, uh, it's interesting that you pose the question, because we are at 14 plus years. We are at that stage where you stand and you sort of look back and say, what am I accomplished and what do I still need to accomplish? I think that it is good business in the, if you look at the way our firm has grown, our reputation has grown, and our technical ability has grown uh, and is really world class. We are recognized uh, whether we are working with Asians, Europeans, Americans, whomever, we are recognized as being you know, uh, right there at the, at the competitive international level. It is uh, not so good business financially, but that is because we live in a very financially insecure environment in Cameroon, where a small firm like ourselves, we have to self-finance everything. We've never received any kind of financial backing from a financial institution to enable us to have a five-year uh, prospective growth or to enter into a new country, to, to open up a new office, and, and so on and so forth. So it's you know, it's got its good points and uh, not so good points. And added to that, the heavy taxes as well. We also have a very uh, burdensome tax system in, in Cameroon. Very, very burdensome tax system. I think the, 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 there is the weight of the taxes in terms of percentages, but I would even dare to say that that is not the, the worst of the problems. The worst of the problems is that our tax system is complex, very difficult to understand. There, uh, you, have, you, you, you have tax officials who have arbitrary powers and therefore uh, makes it a very, it's a really a system that's set up for corruption. The climate is definitely not business friendly. I think, you know, we have these things like the World Bank doing business reports. The 2010 uh, version just came out. Cameroon has dropped in its uh, positioning in terms of uh, its business friendliness as an environment. Um, and I think that, um, you know, sometimes we as Cameroonians, we get these indexes, whether it's World Bank doing business or Transparency International or whatever. And sometimes you look at it and say, well, I didn't need a study to come out and tell me that it's difficult to do business in Cameroon. We know that as Cameroonian entrepreneurs. You know, talking about the World Bank doing business report, what were some of those factors that brought us down? Very clearly, uh, uh, tax is, is, is one of the factors. Access to finance is another one of the factors. And with regard to access to finance, Cameroon is doing rather poorly, even on an African scale. Uh, it's amazing that this country, which has such huge entrepreneurial potential, Cameroonians, uh, uh, they like doing business. They like being entrepreneurs. Um, and they have a very strong work ethic. We really like to work. We go out there. We work a lot of hours. Um, and unfortunately, People cannot get access to finance to be able to really build sustainable businesses. So we end up doing commerce instead of building industries and investing in long-term sectors that can create jobs and build up a whole economy. Let me take you back to strategies. What were some of the legal and regulatory obstacles that you faced? In terms of legal obstacles, we did not face so many legal obstacles, I can say. Uh, we were able to register the company, start the company. At the, at the startup of the company, what is heavy is once again that cost, the, 
the cost for registering the business, you have to do it through uh, um, a, um, uh, uh, what do they, they, they call them, the, the, the legal um, advisors. So you, 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 you have a lot of upfront costs when you want to start a company in Cameroon. Now, we were lucky because, as I said, it's a service business. So we did not need a lot of authorizations and so on. For people who want to start up industries, it can take months to obtain an authorization or to obtain a business license to be able to get started. So this is one of the things that also brings us down in doing business, is the number of days that it takes to start up a business in Cameroon. Uh, I don't have the, the, the numbers off the top of my head, but it's over a month. And you compare that to certain other environments that we know, uh, like Dubai, like Mauritius, where you can be up and running with uh, your business in 24 to 48 hours. You add on to that then all the infrastructure for starting a business, getting a telephone line, getting your internet set up, getting water, getting electricity, or getting a location. All of these elements are very difficult and cumbersome in the Cameroonian uh, setting, where they ought not to be. You are one of those uh, very few women standing high in business. What has been your contribution to fellow women who are trying to step out of their limitations? I think uh, probably that is one of my greatest areas of, of satisfaction, is that we as a company have made a very strong policy to find female talent. Uh, we are a firm that the majority of our shareholders are women. The firm is run by a woman. And uh, we thought the least we can do is to reach out and to find talented women who are looking for opportunity and to help them to build up that capacity and get into the professional world. I think we've done so quite successfully within our company. As I said, we have about 70% of women who work for us in the very tough business, which is consulting. Consulting is very, very tough business. Long hours, a lot of travel, very, very demanding, both physically and intellectually. And we find that um, we are able to find women. And mind you, we do not hire anybody because she's a woman. Nobody. We find women, but all those women have to go through a very rigorous testing and interview process in order to be hired. And we find that they are able to, to do so. They are able to do so. They are able to be successful as international consultants. Uh, I tell you, one of the uh, greatest feelings of satisfaction I have is when I'm sitting uh, either in Washington, D.C., or in Addis Ababa, or in Accra, and uh, I see a female consultant of mine, a young Cameroonian woman, less than 30 years old, um, you know, facilitating a conference with the World Bank, the German Development Corporation, the European Union, and so on. I think this is a, a, a terrific achievement for herself. And it's also something that completely changes the world view, the way the world sees us when they see a woman uh, and an African woman in that, uh, in that position. So we've been able to do that successfully. We've also reached out at the level of our customers, so every business who has worked with us know that we always ask the question, where are the women? Why are they not sitting around this management table? Why are they not sitting around this leadership table? And I want to say that this is not a thing to do because it's nice for women. Okay? Um, research shows that companies that have at least an equal number of women on top management on board level positions perform better financially, perform better in governance, perform better in quality. So it is not uh, something to do because you want to be nice, it's something to do because it makes good business sense. Well, we get to realize that the more some women are educated, the more we find the men involved in corruption scandals, mm. like the case of Cameroon. Mm. You know, I do not think that is true. It is an impression but it's not true. The problem is that there are so few women out there that when we see one and she is corrupt, then we use her as the example to paint all women. But if you look at it, um, take the case of Cameroon, look at the people being put in jail today. How many women are there? But they are okay. there in jail. They are in jail, but very few in comparison. 
very, very few. They are a very small minority in comparison to the men. And there's a greater number of women who are out there not doing anything uh, wrong, per se. So I think that, sure, I am not one of those people who believes that women are more uh, uh, angelic than men. No, we are human beings. We are human beings. We, 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 we are human beings. There are women who are honest, and there are women who are dishonest. There are women who are, have integrity, and there are women who are corrupt. We are just like men. There's no, uh, there's no difference. There's the, the, the thing is that it is important for women to be at the table simply because they have been out of the systems of power. And those who have been out of the systems of power have a tendency to come in with an eye for justice. When you have been left out of the game, you have a tendency to come in and you seek to correct the scales rather than just to grab for yourself. And I think this is what is bringing in the added advantage of, of women to the table. And then let's just say it plain and simple. This is the situation we accept with women. We would never accept, for example, with race. Can we imagine being in a country where blacks are 51% of the population, but they have 5% of the jobs or 3% of the positions in parliament? Yes. Can't do that. Ms. Kawala, when these women come to you, what are some of their problems and pregnant expectations? I think that women you know, have what we generally call uh, a very strong weight of what we call the triple rule. Uh, you know, when a man goes to work, generally speaking, he does not worry about how people are going to eat in his house. He does not worry about how uh, a sick child is going to get to the hospital. He doesn't worry about, um, you know, how the, um, the, uh, the curtains are going to get fixed or, or something like that. And we find that women tend to, if they come out into the professional world, they must also continue to feel, fulfill the same number of social responsibilities, which generally ends up, like you, I am sure you have heard, people say, well, I don't like to hire women because they, you know, they, they're always taking permission. They want to go and... It, At one go point, and, they're pregnant, yes, they want to go and take sick care leave. Of the child. And I think what we have to do as a society is to recognize that social responsibilities are precisely that. They are a responsibility exactly. for the society. Exactly. The roles that women are playing, when a woman is taking a child to the hospital, she is taking care of that future worker, of that future contributor to that economy. Somebody has to do it. We can't just leave the children at home and let them get sick. <laughs> we, somebody has to make sure that people eat, Somebody has to make sure that their clothes are clean and so on. And this is a very, very significant contribution to the functioning of society. So as women go out into the workplace, uh, we must then begin the discussion in our homes already on a one-to-one -one basis to say, OK, if we're both going out in the morning, how is this going to get done? How are we going to take care of this? If we leave the sole responsibility on the woman again, it means that she has two full-time jobs. She leaves, she goes to work, then she comes home at night, she worries about how people are going to eat, how the laundry is going to get done, how the children are going to do their homework, and so on, and then she's up the next morning to go to work. Clearly, she's going to have trouble producing in one or the other of the areas. It can't actually be balanced. So if we start the discussion about how do we redistribute this work as uh, 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 within a family, within a community, how do we rep redistribute it? And how do we recognize it as work? You know, I am always amazed at the number of women I meet whom I say, well, what do you do? And she says, nothing. I don't do anything. And I think, my goodness, you get up in the morning and you sit and you fold your hands. He said, well, no, I'm in the house. I cook. I take care. And so, so even we as women don't recognize what we do as work, whereas it is work. And I think this is uh, one of the most important uh, aspects to, to recognize. On the 14th to the 15th of January, you were in France where you presented nine recommendations to a public made up of French associations on education and entrepreneurship as a key priority in empowering women. Do you think that in Cameroon we are investing enough in this area? I think in Cameroon, as far as entrepreneurship is concerned, 
for anybody. We are not investing enough. Uh, I think that we must realize that economies grow from small businesses. Um, small businesses are those types of businesses who can have 10%, 15% growth over especially that startup period. Um, big businesses tend to grow at lower rates and steadily. And to spur an economy, to kick off an economy, you need these small businesses who are generating new ideas, innovating, employing people, and so on. In Cameroon, we basically don't have any policy with regard to this. We basically don't have any policy at all. Um, you look at a lot of other countries, um, the so-called capitalistic countries, which are supposed to leave uh, entrepreneurs on their own to fight in the market and succeed. And you find that these countries, they provide education, they provide qualification, they provide uh, loans to these small businesses, they provide um, small business uh, nurseries where you can go in, you don't have to pay the startup fees, you have a telephone, you have a secretary, you start up your business for the first year before you start having to look at all those kinds of costs. So other countries have a lot of strategies to uh, encourage entrepreneurship. We simply don't have uh, a policy that I know of. That was Ms. Kawala. She's the Chief Executive Officer of Strategies and a pioneer member of the World Business Forum. We continue right after the break. You have your hands deep into the baskets of politics in Cameroon and you are a member of the National Executive Committee of the SDF, the city councillor of Douala One. Why the interest in politics? Politics is what makes a country go round. Uh, if you look at a country like Cameroon, everything that you complain about, from the road in front of your street, in, in front of your house, which is broken down, to the lack of water. This morning I got up, I turned, off my, turned on my tap and no water. To the educational system, to the lack of jobs, uh, and to poor elections. Every single one of these things is determined by politics. And I uh, left school about 20 years ago and have been working as a business person for about 20 years and have also been very, very uh, active as a community activist for close to 20 years. And after this, all this time and all this investing of myself into these types of activities, I discovered that there is a framework against which I keep hitting. There's a wall which stops us from making real progress, and that wall is politics. And I looked at the political scene in Cameroon, and I looked at what was being done in there, and I looked at the different actors, and I felt that I definitely had something essential to contribute that was not on that scene already. So that's why I got into politics. Why the Social Democratic Front? Why that choice? The Social Democratic Front, because first of all, social democracy um, is close to my own personal ideology. I strongly believe that we must accompany economic growth with um, social equity, such that the society is growing as a whole, and you don't have a small minority of people getting very, very rich, while the rest are, are very poor. Uh, I also believe that stability and long-term um, long -term well-being for each individual is dependent on the whole. If I'm doing fine, and there's 10 people on, around me who are not doing fine, I am in a very insecure position. Which means as these positive factors are being practiced in the social democratic front? It means that this is the social democratic front ideology. Now, um, being put into practice is a challenge for all of us. It is a challenge within the SDF. I will not... Um, uh, How challenging is that? How it is challenging? a challenge. It is a challenge. It is a challenge. It depends. The social democratic front is huge. It's a national party. Uh, you may go to one province and you find that it's working quite well, 
and you go to another province and you find that uh, they are having uh, a little bit of a difficult time with it. But I think most important um, and most encouraging in the social democratic front, for me anyway, is that you have a fantastic group of people really at the base of the party who believe in social democracy, who dedicate their time and energy to social dem democracy, and who are convinced that we can bring that social democratic ideology to Cameroon as a, as a country. So that's why that, I'm there. Uh, the like Don't you think that uh, the party has become very unpopular? I think that the party has had its moments of very high popularity and has its moments where it has to, as a party, look at itself and look at what it's offering to the Cameroonian population. And I think this is normal in the life, of, in the life cycle of a party, that you cannot have, uh, you know, uh, you cannot be a, a extremely popular for 20 years. Um, I think right now, most definitely as a party, we have to look at what we are offering to the Cameroonians as a population. Um, I think that right now we are not unpopular. I believe that we are being demanded by Cameroonians to put something on the table which is credible and which is compelling. And I think that we must take up that challenge as the leadership of the SDF. It's quite curious to know, how do you manage or tend to blend both politics and uh, business? I get that question all the time. <laughs> um, and uh, it's probably a, a, an indicator of what people think about Cameroon, that uh, you know, I don't think anybody asks a French person who is in business, how do you manage politics and business? Um, I think that um, so far, I have not had any difficulty as a politician uh, in business. I know my country well. I could have problems. But so far, so good. Um, and uh, mainly, I think the, the difficulties are more really on the practical level of managing what are two full-time jobs. Because uh, politics is a full-time job. Business is a full-time job. And uh, the difficulty, that for me is where the challenge lies most. Um, and it is also where, luckily for me, I work with really excellent teams, with really excellent people, who um, are young Cameroonians, who are very professional, who get the job done, and who allow me to, to stay at a leadership and a strategic level. But I think probably you're going to see me leaning more uh, to one side or the other. Which side is that going to be? <laughs> Just keep your eyes out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you are a businesswoman. You are, we have very strong political affiliations. Um, what do you think about democracy in Cameroon? First of all, I'm a firm believer in democracy. I believe that, uh, I think it was, I, I don't want to misquote him, but I think it was Winston, Winston Churchill who said, it's really a really, really bad system, but it's the best one we've got. <laughs> so democracy is far from perfect. I don't think it's a perfect system, but I think until somebody shows me something better, uh, that's the best of the, the bad systems that we've, we've got to govern with. And I think that my encounter with Cameroonians, and I encounter a lot of them on a day-to-day -day basis, is that they fundamentally want democracy. They want to live in a democratic country. They want to be able to choose the people who govern them. They want to have a say in the decisions of the country. Um, unfortunately, we have had 50 years of not doing this. And uh, we have a par part of the population which is discouraged, which has maybe given up. Luckily, though, we are a very young population. So while we have people who are in their 60s, who have gone through 50 years since independence and no longer believe in change, we also have people who are 18 years old and who are like, this thing has to change. This thing, I cannot envisage the rest of my life in this system. And so we must push it. We must move it forward. We must do what is necessary to, to, to move towards democracy. It is true that when we talk about democracy, we will never find a country that is perfectly democratic. But what do we need to do to get closer you know, to being uh, democratic? I think the first thing we need to do is to recognize 
as Cameroonians and as Africans that democracy is not a foreign concept. A lot of people present it to us as something coming from the West. We had democratic principles in our traditional systems of governance. If you look at certain parts of our countries, we, of our country, we had uh, strong traditional chiefs. But the chief is put into place by a group of chief makers who have check and balance over him. If he gets out of line, in some parts of the country, the chief makers have the power of death over the king. If he gets out too far out of line, they actually have the right to kill him. So that tells you how strong the checks and balances were. You know, today we talk about gender, like it's a new concept. In my tradition, which is, you know, one of my villages, I have four. Uh, but if I take a, uh, one of my villages, like Balinyonga, every level where you have power in the hands of a man, you have his female counterpart. The form does not rule without a marfon. And she is his first, the first person he goes and consults. The first person from whom he must get buy-in is that representative of the women. So today, when we are talking about some of what looks like modern concepts, we must first recognize, if you look at the Cameroonian, uh, the region in the center and the south, I mean, this is an amazing democratic system. They didn't even have chiefs. They ruled by consensus. The entire clan had to sit down and agree. So you see that the, the, the principles of democracy are in our tradition. So we must first accept that. It's not a foreign thing. It is a thing that exists and that today we have to see how to evolve it into a modern system. Those and consults, the first person from whom he must get buy-in is that representative of the women. And agree. So you see that the, the, the principles of democracy are in our tradition. So we must first accept that. It's not a foreign thing. It is a thing that exists and that today we have to see how to evolve it into a modern system. The second thing is that we must get involved. You know, Cameroonians, they want change. You talk to any Cameroonian out there, I'm telling you, talk to 10 Cameroonians, nine and a half want change, okay? But it is even before you get to the ballot box, you must become politically involved. And when I say politically involved, I don't mean join the SDF. Please join the SDF if that's what you would like to do. It's not a campaign. <laughs> I'd like to do, you are most welcome. But I think what is more important even than being uh, in the SDF is to look at political news, to analyze it, to determine what is the political action I have to take now. We have a fight right now, which is to have a good electoral system. That's not an SDF fight. It is not a UPC fight. It is not an opposition fight. It is a Cameroonian fight. And if necessary, we, we must all be ready to get out into the streets of Cameroon and say, I want to register and have my voter's card. I want to have the electoral calendar of Cameroon. I want to know now when elections will be should not be a secret for one person to know. It is something for all 18 million of us to know. We, want, we should be able to get into the street and so I want to know how many we are. Today, Cameroonians are running out of the country. Going to the US, going to France, going to South Africa. I met with Cameroonians in South Africa a couple of weeks ago. And I said to them, you know, it's interesting. You have run to come to somebody's country that person fought for this democracy, for this freedom. They fought for it for over 100 years. Today, we are running to go to countries where somebody has fought. People have died. Blood has been shed. When we, as Cameroonians who want change, when we who are political talk, people say, eh, how will you make sure that when people get into the streets, they will not be hurt? They will be hurt. There's a cost to freedom. There's a price to but pay. There's a price to pay. But we must pay that price. We have to pay that price. We must pay it for ourselves. We must pay it for our children. We must pay it for all future generations. We must pay it in order to be able to give ourselves the right to be called Cameroonian.
we can't keep running off to somebody else's country who has paid the price. So the answer to your question is, if you want change, get engaged. Get engaged in an association. Get engaged in a movement. Get engaged as an individual. Get engaged. We need you. You know, Ms. Kawala, on the 6th of November, President Bia celebrated his 27th anniversary in PATH. What are your expectations? Absolutely none. Absolutely not. I have not one single iota of an expectation. Why? President Bia is part of the past. Part of your past and not part of your future. He is not part of my future. He's still in power. He is. He's the president of Cameroon. Yes. He's your future. Not at all. Why do you say that? What does he have to offer me? He has absolutely nothing to offer me. I personally am fully engaged so that he loses his job. Fully engaged. He's failed. You know, you judge a president on how well he has done in terms of the economy. The economy is in trouble. You judge him on how well he has done in terms of education. Our educational system is in shambles. You judge him on how well he has done in terms of health. Health care today is less accessible and of worse quality than it was when he took over power. What other criteria? It is not a matter of an individual. I see things in the paper, oh, we are calling for him to. It's not a matter of an individual. It's not a matter of like or dislike. This is a job. It has criteria. You judge the person according to the criteria. Cameroon is an amazing country. We have every single resource that God has ever given to mankind. Every resource. I met a... I met a Malian the, the other day, and he was like, rain. I came to your country, it was raining every day. Look at this person. He's amazed about rain because he doesn't have it in his country. We have every single resource imaginable. We have no excuse, none, to be where we are today. No excuse for Cameroonians to be leaving their country, to living... How can you imagine people leaving paradise to go and live in hell? Paradise is not paradise enough. Exactly. We have, we have allowed, and we must take responsibility for this as Cameroonians. We have allowed a system to take paradise and turn it into something that people actually run away from. And we don't have the right to do that anymore. We must make paradise into what it is. Paradise. You were honored in New York at the Clinton Global Initiative for work carried out in the area of women and economic empowerment. How did you get that recognition? Okay. Yes, this recognition came from um, the Clinton Global Initiative through, uh, with regard to a project I carried out here in Douala as a municipal councillor with the women market traders of the Sandaga market. Um, the project was a project what, which was financed by a number of partners uh, of the Clinton Global Initiative, and they nominated uh, this project. Um, amongst all the projects they financed in the world uh, to, be, to be recognized during the, the, the Clinton Global Initiative. Um, it was really, I think, a great recognition of these women we have over 150 women in the Sandaga market who underwent business. For how long was that? For how long was that? Uh, this is a year-long project. So we have been training them uh, since August of 2008. To the different areas on business, on, on business, uh, on their rights as traders, on the importance of them being knowing who makes decisions in the marketplace. So they took all of these. Um, we got all of these uh, trainings done. The women created their own association. The women um, now decided to, uh, with a little bit of money that was left over, they decided to buy computers. So these market women are training themselves on uh, computer, um, on the computer right now to be computer literate. Uh, they have started their own little mutual fund. So they've given loans to over 50 women. Um, so this project was recognized as something that was able to enhance women who were already, these women are entrepreneurs. They are very tough 
and amazing entrepreneurs. As an entrepreneur, I have nothing but respect for them. They, uh, they work 12 to 15 hour day. They are very innovative and creative and they face a lot of when we talk about doing business. They are faced with the corrupt tax officials, the corrupt market officials, with people who want to cheat them. And, you know, so they are really in a tough business environment. And we need to look at this economically as a country because there are markets all over this country. And in every market are entrepreneurs. This is our economic potential. Sandagan market generates about 31, the women, just the women there, generate about $31 million a year in sales. 800 women sell in that market. So if you look at it like a company, that means that that is a company that's generating that kind of income, $31 million uh, 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 a year, and who, uh, uh, a company that's employing 800 people. That's very, very significant to Douala's economy, for example. And as a country, we need to be looking at how we, we scale the kind of program that I did up to a national level and make these entrepreneurs contribute more, become a significant part of the economy, and become actors that we can deal with. You are a very successful woman, and your success today is born out of the dint of hard work and determination. Any commitment? Any commitment? Uh, I think what my commitment is, very strongly, I, have, I think I've put it out there, is that I am very committed to bringing about national change in Cameroon. I am very committed to taking the hard work and the, um, the potential of Cameroonians and transforming it into what we know is to be one of the greatest capitals, not in Africa, but in the world. In the world. You know, the commitment I'm talking about is what are you very single and you know, available, you know, as a successful woman, or maybe you are in a relationship. Ah, oh, that. <laughs> yes, that. <laughs> I get that question all the time, as you can imagine. Um, I am a single woman. I am not married. I do not have children. Um, as to whether I'm in a relationship or not, I would say, uh, as a single person, I'll keep that uh, information to myself. <laughs> why, why is it that most uh, businessmen who are successful, or those who are successful get divorced, or those who are successful are not married at all? I don't know that it's always the case. I know a lot of women entrepreneurs who are married and have children and, 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 and have families. Um, very clearly, I think the model that society offers us today uh, for some of us as women is not one that we find necessarily to be where we would be most comfortable. And then I think also that we must realize that um, it is much more, it, it's a lot less deliberate than that. Life happens, you know. Uh, life happens if you go along life and uh, you meet a man that you feel that, okay, we would be comfortable moving on together, then you get on with that man. If you don't meet one, my goodness, you don't stop living. You continue enjoying life, right? <laughs> uh, so I think that it's, it's a lot less deliberate. You know, I wish uh, matters uh, of the heart were as uh, easy as business. You know, in business, we calculate one plus one equals two. And uh, if you add profit, it equals three. You get the exact answer. And, and you get the exact answer. Matters of the heart tend to be a bit more complicated than that. Ms. Kawala, thank you for the contributions you've made on women development and women economic empowerment. Thank you. It is a pleasure. And uh, I just hope for all your listeners out there that we're going to have both men and women who are com committed to the economic and the political empowerment of Cameroon. That was Ms. Kawala we have on the show today. She is uh, a pioneer member of the World Business Forum. She's a chief executive officer of Strategies. And uh, she has also worked a lot in areas of empowering women. She is a councillor at the Douala City Council. That was all we had time for. We thank you for watching. Expect another new edition of the program next week. Goodbye.